Hi everyone, welcome to our Power Tools training, where each month we do a deep dive into a, an area of anyone's digital program, <laughs> uh, whether it's analytics, communications, and in this case, writing. So you'll see a Mad Men theme throughout, and that's really because the core principles and ideas that we'll talk about today you know, are really grounded in kind of the first era of advertising and marketing. Um, obviously, the landscape has changed significantly, and there are many more channels and media to be thinking about. But we're really excited to be joined by Missy, a senior copywriter here at Blue State, who has experience working at a variety of ad agencies, uh, and now Blue State, for a range of clients across nonprofits, brands, and FC organizations. And she's going to share some of her background to kind of her process and guide to writing amazing emails and content for those clients. So Peggy says, um, we'll cover some core principles here and then we're going to break it down among, you know, email and social and, and dive into some of the particulars of each of these channels and areas of our programs. But first, uh, Missy wanted everyone to be sure that you have uh, her inspiration and a book that she keeps on her desk and refers to often, which is Hey Whipple Squeeze This. Uh, Luke is one of kind of the premier copywriters um, and it's a really accessible guide to how to create amazing language and copying content that will motivate people, that will inspire them emotionally and ultimately get them to do what you want to do. So it's very digestible and highly recommend. Obviously it came out probably before the digital age, um, but again, these, these core truths remain. So let's dive into some core tried and true principles. In thinking through uh, the title for this training, we also did a quick exercise to write like a few variety of, a variety of how you could call this training or what you could call it. Um, five things you're not doing and should start immediately. The internet called and said, stop doing this. Um, this is kind of an exercise that we do almost every day when we're writing um, subject lines and headers and all that stuff. But in, in an effort to kind of walk the walk here, you can see that you can convey, um, you know, this single idea in so many different ways. And that makes it really fun because kind of sky's the limit, um, but also means that you need to have kind of a clear sense of what you're trying to do, uh, what the brand voice is, and understand your audience to make sure that whatever you land with, uh, you know will resonate and be effective. Which leads us to number one, establish your brand voice. So I know for a lot of us, and myself included, you know, you can quickly get thrown into a campaign environment or a really busy time during your organization's year and kind of just have to start writing and going and producing from scratch or if not from scratch, at least you just kind of have to go. <laughs> and that's definitely necessary sometimes, but what will really save you a lot of trouble and ultimately create a better experience for your audience is if you take some time uh, recommended across the organization, so kind of branching out beyond digital for this, but really set down on paper what your brand voice and tone is. Um, this is, can be a guiding light. This also ensures that after you leave, or if you're out, uh, someone else could take it and run and kind of mirror or build off of you know, the core brand voice. But if that foundation is not there, um, you're gonna get a lot of disparate content, uh, disparate experiences for your audience. And given how diverse and multi-channel every organization's digital program is and how you one you know support or user can interact with you in so many different places this consistency and this core uh, agreed upon voice is that much more important and so we're going to be sending along some guidelines to help you get that started if you don't have it in place already but i assure you that by investing a little time in this um, it'll save you a lot of trouble and ultimately create again a better experience for your people down the road second once you've established you know, kind of the core principles of who we are, uh, what your organization wants to sound like, the do's and don'ts, you know, really own the fact that you as a digital practitioner represent the audience. And so while you're writing copy, while you're writing a campaign or a single email, 
you know, I'm sure that many of us have to go through a certain level of approvals. Sometimes that's legal or field or communications. And yes, of course, there are things that you can and cannot say, and we want to respect that. But the way you say it and your expertise in your audience should really be the primary focus. So when you sit down to write something, really think about the person on the other end. Uh, is this something that will feel relatable to me? Is this something that you know, feels like another human wrote it, that it's not just you know, kind of brand jargon or super insidery, that you know, this is accessible? And ultimately, you know, really peel away the layers of a huge list or whatever your, your, your audience is and really think about these people as individuals and think about what you would want to receive were you to get this in your inbox or see this in your social feed. But I think the really the difference between that kind of writing and really effective writing is taking it a step further. So the writer will say, okay, there's my distilled idea. Now, how can I word it in the most compelling way possible? And the answer is always just trial and error. You know, you like you write the line every which way and then you take a, a step away from it and you come back to it and you assess what you've written. Um, and you see what sticks. And of course, in digital, we have the benefit of testing. So you can, if there's a few different angles that you're really liking, you can test into it and see what works. Need more punctuation, capital letters, or emojis? Go back and try again. So this is what I learned on day one when I took a copywriting course. And I think we forget this a lot when we're writing for the digital space because the internet is so conducive to emojis and lots of punctuations and M dashes and all caps, you know, donate, donate, donate. Um, and of course there's a place for that. So I, I will remind you that this is the, this is the rule. And of course there are exceptions to this rule, but it's good to keep in mind when you're writing a first draft that the most effective copy won't need all the caps lock and the M dashes and the ellipses because if the line is working hard enough, um, you'll just find that you don't need it. And if you do need it, it might mean that the line is not working quite hard enough. And, and I should have said this earlier, but we're gonna show you examples of what we mean by all of this in the next section. And the fifth principle, talk about the benefits to your audience, not to you. Your reader doesn't care about the nitty gritty details. So. This is something that I like to call the curse of too much knowledge, which is something that we all have as ambassadors of our brands and organizations. Just the very fact that you work for this organization means you probably know too much already. You, need, you know more than your reader wants or needs to know. And so an important thing is to really just tell the reader what's gonna benefit them and leave everything else at the door if you can. Um, or at least, you know, when, you know, put the things that will benefit your reader first, you know, the why, why should I take this action? Why should I open your email? And then all of the details and the things that will satisfy all the other stakeholders in your head when you're writing, bury that and put that, you know, closer to the bottom because in the end, what you want is for your reader to take the action that you're trying to get them to take. Okay, we lied. There's a sixth principle, but five sounded like a nice, nicer, rounder number. Um, the final one is don't give the milk away for free. Withhold some of the good stuff to entice your people to open, click, or do whatever you want them to do. And that is true for all different media, but especially in digital. Um, you know, if you've ever wondered why next Netflix shows are so damn addicting, it's because each episode ends at a cliffhanger, leaving you no choice but to click next episode. And that same principle applies to your copy, whether it's a subject line or a social graphic or, um, or a Facebook post, call to action in an email. Um, if you want me to click, don't tell me everything I want to know right away. Um, you've got to tease me towards that finish line. Cool. So those are our core principles. Um, and I know that, you know, everything sounds great in theory, but you really want to see how this comes to life in your daily work online through email, through social, through all the digital communications that you're responsible for. So um, here's how we're going to break it down. Um, here are some basic elements to most of the writing that I think a lot of you will, are doing on a daily basis. You have subject lines, body copy in your emails or on websites, um, the ask, which is always very important, graphic copy, whether it's in the email or on social, and then writing for social as well. Um, and so those are the elements that we're going to look at today, kind of keeping in mind those, um, those core principles I talked about 
earlier. So let's start with subject lines. Um, the subject line is so important because it's your first impression. And if they don't like your subject line and opt out of opening your email, they won't see all that other awesome stuff that you've created. So that's your first barrier. Um, and what I like to do with subject, so here's just some basic quick tips and I'll explain each one a little bit. Um, write it after you've written the email. Um, not everyone agrees about this, but this is what I find works for me. I write my email first, I get it to the best place possible. And that often when, you know, when the copy for the email is great and exactly how I want it, the subject line often starts to write itself. The most interesting parts of your email will bubble up to the top and you'll start to be able to see where you can tease them, what kind of angles you can take for your subject line. So I like to visit the subject line after the email, unless you know maybe there's circumstances where that doesn't apply. Um, write about 10 variations. Um, you know, just start with a blank page and start coming at this email from every angle and assess, you know, you know, what would a really mysterious, um, click baby type subject line look like? What would an earnest, really straightforward subject line look like? You know, which benefit can you tout? Are there three different benefits, right? Three subject lines. Um, you know, lots of different ways in, write them all. Don't censor yourself at all. Just kind of see what's working. Um, and if you test subject lines, which we all do pretty often, um, it's a great thing to test. I always suggest having a clear hypothesis. So, you know, if you're looking to find out what works better, a clickbait version or, you know, a straightforward version, write similar subject lines that come at it at come at the idea at those two angles and test them. Um, personalization versus no personalization, that kind of thing. Um, again, give them a reason to open. So, you know, for example, if this email landed in your inbox, would you want to open it? You know, I call that the me test. Um, consider what else might be appearing in their inbox on a given day. You know, what will make your subject line stand out? You want to um, kind of diversify from the crowd. And um, as a side note, something interesting to try, which I've been doing more and more, is having the subject line play off the preview text. So in certain browsers, such as Gmail, um, you'll get a few lines of preview text that don't even necessarily need to appear in your email. Um, and how can you make your subject line and preview text tell an even greater story to entice someone to click or even get part of your message without clicking? So here's a quick exercise that I thought would be interesting. Um, this is an example of an email I wrote for Heifer International. Um, and you know, take a quick glance at the email, get the gist of it, and then I'll kind of go through with you my process for how, how, how do you go about writing a subject line um, for this email. Again, my process usually is that I'll write the email first, and then I'll go back and say, what can my, my subject line be? So as you can see, this is an email around um, holiday shopping. Um, we're urging you to buy meaningful gifts through the heifer catalog. The heifer catalog consists of animals that are given to poor, um, you know, um, families in developing countries, families that are um, struggling with hunger. So there's lots of different angles that you could pursue here. There's the question answer angle, you know, that that you see up front. Question, hint, answer. Um, maybe something like you know hitting on that angle. There's the holiday shopping angle, um, the shopping list you know, the making it personal, um, the best gifts for you, um, meaningful gifts, or even the animal angle for milk. So those are all different um, potential ways in. The subject lines we ended up going for for this email was shopping list for your loved one versus best gifts for Jilly, you know, whatever the first name is, um, with a fallback, your people. So this was a subject line test. Um, ultimately, we really liked the shopping angle because at the time that this email was sent, we knew that shopping for holiday gifts was top of mind for our audience. Um, and we wanted to test the idea of list versus gift. Um, and our, just as an FYI, our results here were really a draw. Um, it was an insignificant result, but um, at least we did have a hypothesis there. So here is a quick game I want to play called Guess Which Subject Line Won. This was for the United States Olympic Committee. We had, this was a subject line test where A was, do you heart Team USA? Subject line B was, get a free Team USA sticker. Which one do you think won? Drum roll, please. It was subject line B. And it, it, it got double the amount of open rates as subject line A, which should come as no surprise because subject line A is all about 
the brand, Team USA, whereas subject line B is all about me, the reader, and why, why I will benefit from opening this email. And I think that this was a really clear example of why that works. Okay, so moving on to our second item on the list of elements is body copy. And this is the big one. So this, I think, is where your brand guidelines really come into play. Um, and again, writing in full sentences, you know, trying to avoid um, overuse of pithy, you know, short sentences with lots of um, all caps and emojis. Um, I also like to say being real is better than being clever. The truer your message and the realer your tone, the more your email and your message will resonate with your readers. Um, of course, being clever is always a bonus, but if, you had to, if I had to choose, I would choose authenticity every time. Write like no one is scrolling. This is an important one, and it means don't bury the lead. Um, brevity is always your friend. People rarely read every word of an email, so don't leave the important stuff for last always get it as close to the top as you possibly can or in the thing that pops most in the email sometimes that's the graphic um, whatever it may be and you know if you are writing many many emails from with the same voice and the same tone from the same people um, one way to start to one opportunity to stray from your brand voice is guest senders and it's a great way you know if you have a guest sender who has a really strong personality um it's an excuse and an opportunity to kind of stray from the rules that you've established and it's it's a lot of fun sometimes for your readers so i want to go through like a few examples of these tips kind of brought to life here's an example of a tate um Brit, a tate britain email um that starts with a really beautiful graphic um and a very short line that kind of introduces the theme of this email art changes so do we this was an email that was introducing um the new launch of a new wing of the tape modern and the theme of it is all about transformation um so the copy the body copy kind of delivers on that theme that was introduced by our graphic um i know the text is really small but that circled um, paragraph says, you know, when Tate Modern opened in 2000, it transformed Britain's relationship with modern and contemporary art. Now, second transformation is underway. Um, so again, like the pros are kind of working hard for themselves. You don't kind of need to hit someone over the head with it. Um, in this next example for USOC, this I thought was a really nice use of word choice. You know, in that graphic, it says, last chance sign uh, signed by Thursday for a chance to hang out with Team USA. Um, it's kind of setting the tone, you know, doesn't hanging out with Team USA sound way more fun than meeting them. Um, similarly, you'll see in the body copy, the benefit to the reader is really clear and makes it makes this sound really fun. There's probably a million ways that you could describe the benefits of signing this postcard, but the way it's described includes, you know, details like the red carpet and live TV and even like a little wink at the end, hi mom, you know, something, if it feels appropriate, if it feels on brand and part of the voice, things like that that make it seem like a letter to your friend, always a positive. And one more example here, this is what this was a nice um, example of not giving the milk away for free. This was a big announcement made last week by the Obama Foundation. Um, and the goal was really to get people to click through to the landing page because we wanted them to get the holistic experience of learning about the architect that was selected. We didn't want them to just read the email and close it. So we decided to withhold the names of the of the architects from the email itself and kind of tease the content a little bit in that graphic and we saw really high open rates here because naturally people wanted to know um and then finally i think body copy is something that can be interpreted in a lot of different ways and so i think we we get into our routine of like what's my hook what's my call to action what are the two paragraphs that are going to describe the reasons to believe and then what's my sign off but sometimes when you take a moment and then take a step back and say is there a more compelling way altogether to express this idea um is there a concept here that i'm not thinking of and of course like you know 
this is an example from the Bernie campaign and they benefited from a design staff that really um, made this work. But I think it's a great example of, you know, this is an email that's talking about overturning Citizens United, which I'm sure many of you, if you're on, you know, progressive email chains, get a lot of emails about. But this was done in a really different and really fun and highly visual way. Um, it's a text message conversation between Ben and Jerry um, of the ice cream theme. Um, and, you know, I, I encourage you all to read it. Um, at your leisure, but it's it's a really entertaining um, way to send an email. So moving on to the ask, which is a really, really important part of all our jobs um, is, you know, what is the language that is asking someone to do the thing you want them to do? Um, so, you know, when it's time to write that call to action, I ask myself, why should anyone do this? Lead with the why, not the what. Um, and then, you know, similar to the the subject line, what are five other ways you could phrase it? So, you know, there's the distilled core idea and then take a look again and say, what are some other creative ways in? Um, and then a nice exercise also is, you know, a lot of times we'll just link the text, you know, we'll make the text bold and we'll link through to the, we'll link the call to action copy through to the landing page. But what might that call to action sound like if it were a button instead? You know, what would it sound like if it were on a t-shirt. Um, it's just an interesting exercise to help you um, think about it in different ways. So here I wanted to provide some examples of um, calls to action that were a little bit different and were interesting to me. Um, this is an example of a United States Olympic Committee email. It's a standard fundraising ask with a countdown clock saying give now before the deadline. But this one line of copy I thought did a really nice job of being matter of fact but sneaking in a little bit of that you know, pie in the sky kind of feel, you know, the, the emotion of it, you know, why give? Because donating to Team USA is the single best way you can help make American athletes dreams come true at the Rio games. You know, that dreams come true line kind of elevates the language a little bit. And here's an example from a retail brand. And I think it's really important to see what, you know, if you're only looking at what nonprofits are doing, that you kind of have a narrow view of what's out there. Brands are doing some really interesting things. And I think that the lessons can certainly apply to advocacy and fundraising and all of that. This is an example of a cosmetics brand called Glossier, and they do really creative things with their call to action. It's always a button, but they don't, you know, sometimes the language in there isn't even written as a call to action. They're almost writing it from your voice in this instant, you know, I want that. It's setting a real tone and it has a lot of attitude. And I don't know about you, but it certainly works for me. Um, and again, here, this is, you know, a standard um, ask to, you know, to vote. Um, but I thought it was interesting that instead of saying vote today, um, they said don't stay home today. Um, and it's just kind of turning it on their head, thinking about something from the other side in a different angle. Um, it might not be the first thing you think of, it might be the fifth thing, but that's the benefit of making that list and thinking about things from different angles. Okay, so moving on to writing for graphics. And this is kind of where, um, you know, email writing gets closer to writing for traditional ad advertising. Um, and it can get really fun. So, you know, the first tip here is that art and, sh and copy should build on each other. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, the art and copy should have greater meaning together than the sum of their parts. You don't want to repeat in copy what I can already see in the image and you don't want to repeat in the image what I can already gain from the copy. So it's like making them complement each other um, is what's going to work the best and that also works for social graphics as well. Um, again, is there a way to stand, at, you know, to write the copy for um, this graphic in a way that um, it reads like an ad. Is it short, you know, short, punchy, intriguing? If this was the only thing that I read and I didn't read a line of copy in the email, would I get the whole thing? Would I be enticed enough to click? Um, it's important to know when, when you should be lighthearted versus serious versus witty. Um, there's a time and a place. And of course, it may not fit, you know, witty may not be part of your brand voice at all. And that's totally okay. Um, and it's just important to know that. Uh, the, the, the source is your friend. And I think that especially with graphics copy, 
you know, if you're kind of stuck in the same words, a lot of us have words that we use very often for our brands. Um, and if you feel like it's getting stale, it's getting dry, um, no harm in breaking out that thesaurus and saying, you know, what are other ways that I can express this thing? Um, and the final one, be anything but neutral. Um, I think that especially with ad writing and writing for graphics, you know, the last thing you want to be is meh. You know, you could be, you want to be very something, whether it's emotional or lighthearted, but you know, you don't want, if you're satisfying all of the needs, then most likely you're just hitting somewhere in the middle and it's going to be neither here nor there. So again, I wanted to show a few examples of this in action. Um, this top graphic was used for a matching gift for Heifer International. So the appeal for Heifer is the animals. A lot of people like to see the animals. So we kind of used a clone of the animal here to show double your gift um, and using merry and bright, you know, like the lyrics from a Christmas song to kind of bring that into a more timely, playful, lighthearted graphic copy. Um, you know, the second one down here, I thought it was really an interesting way. Um, it's a simple infographic with a stat about poverty, children, ch child poverty in California. But the interesting thing to me here was the question, is that fair? Um, it, was an, it was just kind of taking an idea we've all seen many times before and expressing it in a new and interesting way. So I know a lot of people had questions about kind of writing for social, and I think a lot of these same rules apply. Um, there are slight differences on Facebook um, because I think copy that tends to do really well on Facebook is overwhelmingly positive. People go, Facebook is a place people go to be happy and to think happy thoughts, and I think that's something to keep in mind no matter what your organization does. Like, what is the positive spin? What is the glass half full? And that should predominantly be your content on Facebook. You want it to be super conversational, maybe even more so than in on email. Um, you want to have like a little bit of a wink, a little bit of an attitude. Um, would you share it? Again, the me test is important here. Is this something that like I would be compelled to share? Um, and keep in mind, you're next to post about weddings and babies. So again, here, like a, a fun picture of bunnies, fluffy bunnies, and a little pun, somebody loves you, you know, it did pretty well because it, blend, it, it fit right in to the theme of, you know, fun, not too heavy content. Um, Twitter is ch changing more and more towards the traditional news feed for, you know, for multimedia, and I think that um, the writing for this um, should reflect that. Should reflect that change. You know, you have updates, links, announcements. Um, they should be short and sweet. And um, a lot of times, you know, a pre-populated link will the metadata will show a, a really striking graphic, um, a little bit of preview copy. So make sure that you're not um, repeating the copy in your in the actual tweet that's already populating through the metadata, you know, nine, nine eye-opening ways to gain a new perspective on the refugee crisis. Um, what can I add to that in my tweet copy rather than repeat it word for word? It's an important thing to be thinking about. Um, so moving on to Instagram, which is an increasingly popular place for brands to be, um, I think, you know, some of the main points here is to remember where you are. Um, this is a medium for real photography, for authenticity. It's not a place for very highly designed graphics or block text. Um, you know, you might not, not have a professional photographer for your organization and that's okay. Um, I think anything, you know, even if it's something that you took on your iPhone, a glimpse behind the scenes at your organization or, you know, out in the field doing the work that you do, um, I think that's interesting to people and I think there's an opportunity to tell a real story on on Instagram. Um, I, I wouldn't be afraid to play with length on Instagram. I think that if you have a compelling story to tell, people will read it, even if it's wordy. So don't be afraid there. And you know, I think you can, the lengths can vary. Um, and hashtags are sadly your friend. I know that, you know, a lot of them can get really tedious. Um, but it is how a lot of people who are interested in certain subject matters find you on Instagram. So if you're interested in building your, your follower base, um, definitely don't be shy about your hashtags. And of course, curate, 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 you know, you, you have, you want to bring your brand to life in a specific way on Instagram. And I think that you should just be mindful of, 
um, you know, the impression that you're giving on Instagram. If I think it's better to not post anything at all than perhaps post something that's, you know, just meh, neither here nor there. Um, so keep that in mind. And here, just as a basic reminder, um, before you hit send or publish or tweet or post just about anything, um, basic reminder to have an outsider read it, checklist it for grammar and links, making sure everything works and appears correctly, and tweaking for various recipients. So if you're segmenting, um, you know, whatever it is that you're sending or you're only sending it to certain people, just make sure it applies to the recipient um, whoever they may be. And that is the end of my portion here. Great. Thanks, Missy. Well, hopefully you can feel a little bit more like John Hamm or John Draper <laughs> uh, sitting on the California coast after getting all these great tips. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I hope you haven't seen it. Um, we do have a couple of questions, so I'll just dive right in and continue to ask them in the Q&A module. First, uh, this was in reference to the email or body section. So do you see a lower click-through rate when you have such a large graphic above the fold? I think he was referencing uh, the Tate sample. Um, that's interesting. I So in almost all of these instances, the graphic is clickable to the landing page. So we haven't seen a significant drop in clicks um, by putting such a large image there, but I would recommend always making that that image clickable to the landing page just so that, you know, because again, right, like no one is scrolling, um, you don't want them to have to wait to click if that if they're interested in just um, sending it through. I'm sure that's also especially important for mobile, just making sure that the images yes. um, are responsive and appear, you know, in the correct way. Yes, mobile. absolutely. And that's yeah. something we do a lot for Heifer as well. Um, when our when our emails are optimized for mobile, the image always appears first, but we also put a button in our graphics so that people know for sure that it's clickable, um, and it always is. And we, we do not see a drop in, in our response rates. Awesome. Another question just in terms of content or inspiration or organizations that you think are doing a great job. Um, Ali would love to see examples of subject lines and email texts that aren't asking for money or support, but more of a take action. So like when you are trying to get a person to contact their rep or clean up a river. Um, I know we had some examples from 350.org, but any other organizations that are more on the advocacy or action side? Um, that's interesting. I think I'm trying to think off the top of my head of like ones that have stood out to me um, for advocacy. I think um, the NAACP has some really nice um, subject lines. They're very subtle. Um, a lot of times they'll test lines that or just one or two words um, that are emotional, but not necessarily giving away what it is they want you to do. I know they do a lot of testing against, you know, kind of straightforward uh, subject lines for that. Um, and yeah, I mean, in the follow-up, I'll definitely think of some additional ones, but that was one that came to mind yeah, immediately. Great. Um, going back to some of the core principles, how do you suggest developing a brand voice and staying consistent with it? Have you had any successes or tips there? Yeah, that's a, it, it's not an exact science. It's definitely an art. Um, and one of the things that we'll be sending to you in follow-up materials is one of, is a template that might help you guide along the process of, of creating the guidelines. Um, you know, I think one thing that's helpful is kind of getting together with a few people within the organization and brainstorming, you know, what are our primary, you know, if our brand were a person, how would you describe them in three traits? Um, and then, you know, kind of, you know, I've done this exercise where you're, you know, pinning on a wall, all the, all the traits that come to mind and then kind of clustering them and looking at the clusters and saying, okay, these are all kind of talking about one area. So how do we name that area? Um, and then kind of coming up with three pillars or three traits that your brand sh voice should embody. Um, and then a brand voice guideline will just basically be a short document that, br that expands on those traits a little bit. What does it mean to be, for example, um, you know, what does it mean to be I don't know, I'm like at a loss for a word, but what, you know, playful. Let's say you say that, you know, your brand personality, one of the things that really stands out about your brand is that it's playful. Well, what does that mean? And I think, you know, the brand voice guideline can help you determine, well, playful is in within, you know, it is, 
it's not silly, but it is fun. And what are the constraints um, that lie within and without, um, outside of those, those boundaries? That's great. This is probably a common question or occurrence for people. So uh, for a monthly email from our CEO that has the potential of being skipped over or quickly skimmed through, do you have any tips to grab attention without looking too spammy? So in this case, you're saying that the sender is yeah, it's like a is the CEO. CEO. Uh -huh. um, well, I think that because you're sending from an individual and it's that individual's voice, one thing is I would try to be as true to that person's actual voice as possible. And you know, when when I have um, been tasked with sending from a particular person that is not normally a sender, I'll usually get on the phone with them um, and even voice record it and even try to lift actual phrases or lines that they that they said. Um, because I think that, you know, rather than pretending to be real, like the ideal is to actually be real. Um, but I, you know, so if it sounds real and it sounds like it's coming from a person, I think that can help improve the open rates. But one thing that I think also, you know, organizations tend to do, and I see this a lot in my inbox, is like they'll like name the weekly address or they'll, you know, they'll say, you know, they'll at the very top or in the subject line, they'll say, here's your week, your monthly letter from X. Um, but that's not really giving me a reason to open, you know, like what, what is the really interesting bit in there that will make me click? Um, and that's really what you should be bubbling up to the top. Um, so I would say, you know, that just the fact that the CEO is writing isn't interesting in and of itself hit the message that he or she is going to convey is the reason to click. And so let's bubble that up to the very top. I love that. So this is a, I'm sure people have many opinions on this, but what are your thoughts about the use of hashtags on Facebook? Hashtags on Facebook? Oh man. Um, well, they're definitely overused, but um, that's a personal, <laughs> that's a personal gripe. I don't, you know, it's funny because I don't, I don't see the direct use for it as much as I do on Twitter or Instagram. You know, I think, I think that, there is a contingency of people very active on Instagram and Twitter that you really use the hashtags to find what they're looking for or to start following people who are interested in the same things that they are. I'm not sure the exact connection, if that exact same connection applies on Facebook. Um, so I think the real answer is I just don't know. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's also particular to your audience too. Yeah. So depending on what they're used to or maybe how they communicate, you know, maybe spend some time digging in there um, or potentially doing a test to be an ad or something so that, you know, it might be unique to your audience too, which I think is probably true to all of this. Yeah, but, absolutely. Yeah. And I've seen like, I've seen hashtags come in handy on Facebook for an event. For example, if someone wants to see all posts from a particular event um, and the event has a special hashtag, um, that is a definite good use case. Um, but yeah, I'm not really sure. All right, so building on social, and this is obviously a hot topic these days, um, and we actually chose not to include Snapchat, Snapchat because there aren't links, and we wanted to be really focused on driving action here, but do you have any advice on using Snapchat for someone's brand? That is a good question. I am pretty new to Snapchat myself, to be honest, so I'm just starting to learn about the applications that can be used for brands and for organizations. Um, I think it is, it seems to me like it is its own language and it is its own thing. And so I'm not even sure that a lot of these, I mean, I think the fundamentals of writing may apply. Um, but what seems, um, what seems to me to stand out about Snapchat is, um, kind of the behind the scenes, really raw, unedited look. I mean, I think perfection is not what you're striving for in Snapchat. You want it to be real. Um, even if real has mistakes, you know, even if it's kind of, you know, has jagged edges, I think people want to see behind the scenes on Snapchat. And so, you know, I think it's just, you know, a don't be lame, be interesting, um, you know, and keep it as real as possible. And probably have someone who's really used to the platform and like, yeah, oh, immersed yeah. in it be the one creating the content because I think it's really easy to be lame on it if you're not kind of speaking the Snapchat language. <laughs> yeah, like I think that like insiders can detect an outsider. Yeah. So have an insider be the one that's posting those. Major demographics issue too, as you said before, right? Only a certain percentage of the Snapchat community may be within your, your list. 
I think I just read yesterday that uh, only about 15% of Snapchat is above the age of 35. So if that doesn't meet with your demographics, then it might not be worth your time at all. It just kind of depends on, on where your, your people are. All right. Last call for any questions while we have Missy here. No. All right. So we're going to give you 20 minutes back. Um, thank you so much for joining. As I mentioned, we'll be joining, we'll be sending all the materials, uh, slides, recording, and the brand voice guidelines, which I think will be really helpful for everyone. Um, you'll be receiving those tomorrow. Thanks so much for joining and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye, guys.